Have you ever felt like the puzzle pieces of your life just don't fit? Now imagine finding out decades later that you weren't just a piece of the wrong puzzle. You were in the wrong box altogether. Today, we're sharing one of the most mind-blowing, heart-wrenching stories we've ever featured on Family Twist. Shirley Munoz Newsom, the author of The Little Dark One, a true story of switched at birth, takes us on a journey of betrayal, resilience, and love that you truly have to hear to believe. From the moment Shirley discovered she'd been switched to birth, her world slipped upside down. But this story is more than just a shocking DNA revelation. It's about finding family in the unlikeliest places, healing from trauma, and the power of faith to carry you through life's toughest twists. And let's just say, betrayal and tabloid scandals are only the beginning. Stick with us, because this episode will have you questioning everything you thought you knew about family. Shirley, welcome to the Family Twist Podcast. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me. I hope everything goes great this time. <laughs> it's going to go great. I can, I can just feel it. <laughs> so listeners, uh, I met Shirley at the Untangling Our Roots Summit earlier this year. Just a magical weekend, like one of the an unforgettable weekend, I would say. And it just, you know, full of adoptees and NPEs and donor conceived people and their support system. You know, it was just great. Reflecting on that weekend, surely, like, how do you feel about our community? I um, visited with Lily Wood and she said, it's a group of nodding heads. And I thought that is so true because typically when we say something to someone, like even in my family, they're like, oh, but they don't get it. And most people don't. So the sum, the summit was the first time I had ever been in a group of people that understood. And it was such a phenomenal feeling to, to have someone just go, yeah, I get that. I think since I moved away from my hometown, I lost the people that knew how I really felt about my adoption and, you know, growing up that way, because it's so funny now that as an adult, when I started meeting people and telling my story, they made such wild assumptions about the way I would feel. And it was so interesting for me to hear, you know, what their theories were about, you know, how an adoptee would feel. So it was really, it's, I didn't expect to find those differing um, opinions, but I definitely did. I'm so looking forward to the next summit and Kendall getting to attend this time because, you know, the, and he said this a few times on both of our podcasts, but until we started doing this, he didn't realize how much he needed this. I mean, this is so therapeutic. And I think, every, you know, and, and we've had the same, you know, every, everybody we talk to, it's the same, you know, it's like just being able to have these conversations and, you know, letting, letting go of some of the anger and frustration too, and then letting in some of the light. You know, it's just, you know, we're healing a little bit every day. In my case, being switched at birth, I gravitate towards women who could be my mother, you know, and now I understand that I just, I need that mother. In, and I have two really, well, three really amazing mothers in my life, you know, but now they're getting older and it's like, oh, you know, and some of them aren't feeling doing so well. And it's like, it's devastating to me because I think, God, you just gave her to me and now don't take her from me. It's, uh, it's interesting, you know, Kendall, because he's not in contact with his birth mother and both of his other mothers have passed. So now, but fortunately, we do have Kendall's former stepmother <laughs> yeah. who knew about him, you know, from, from, you know, from his birth. And was always hoping that someday, you know, they would be reunited. And so now we, we have her. And like, we don't agree on everything. Like, this is not a political show, but, you know, we don't agree on everything. But like the, her and uh, her family uh, have just been so open to us. You know, we go to their uh, holiday party every year and it's like, it's, it's a blast. It's like 60, 70 people and everybody's just super welcoming, you know. Yeah. It makes me feel like I'm one of the cousins, even though I'm not i mean you know biologically i'm not but it's just fun to be accepted like that and then too i realized that 
DNA does not make a family, but love does. Because I have these people that I just love and care for, and they have treated me kinder than my bio and raising family, my immediate family. My extended family has been wonderful, but my immediate family. I, I have a relationship with my raising brother, Bill, that I talk about in my book. He's just, you know, when he found out I had been switched at birth, he said, Cheryl, I never thought you were my full sister. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, look at you. And I had no idea he felt that way. You are lucky in that sense that you have that mother. Yes. I, I feel really happy when we came to visit New England for the first time to meet my dad's, my biological father's family. We met her like the morning after we arrived, you know, and it was just, it was just wonderful. I remember her hugging me and saying, oh, it's the baby that we always wanted to find, you know, and it, I just teared up, you know, it was just, it's just wonderful to, to be um, accepted. And I, you know, I think partly of what has like kept Kendall together too, is that he's always had my family. Like I'm very close with my family and just uh, came back from a weekend with my sister and niece for her sweet 16th in New York city. And, and, he, and my mother adores Kendall. She's crazy, but you know, <laughs> we love her. <laughs> She's a sweetheart. I've had other mothers-in-law, so let's say that. And uh, this is the best one by far. <laughs> You, you mentioned switched at birth before this coming to this realization. I know your story is like decades in the making. Like, was that, was that even a concept for you? Like, we don't really hear about that much at all, except in the movies. No, not until my DNA test came back. And that was in 2001. So there really wasn't any way for me to research. I mean, it was pre Google. So I started digging around and, and remembering things that were said to me as a child, like, oh, Cheryl, you were born in, in the hallway. There was a woman having problems, so they took mom out in the hallway and took the other woman in, and you were born in a hallway. So when I start doing all my research, there aren't, I go to the library, to the microfiche, and go through all the newspaper articles. And, and this was a small town, you know, like 3,500 people in 1958 when I was born. There's only one baby listed. I thought, okay, I know there were two, which in 1958, you were shamed. You were sent to aunt whoever house to have a baby. And, and it most certainly wasn't publicized. So then I thought, okay, from that point on, it was like I knew in my heart that I had been switched at birth because, you know, the raising mother, when I took my DNA test results to her, you know, she just looked at me and said, well, if he's not your father, I'm not your mother and I will take a DNA test to prove it. That's all she said to me. And I, I thought, I thought about that and about the other baby being born. And I just knew that's what it was. That's cold. That is really cold. Ooh. All right. What a happier note. Congratulations on the International Latino Book Awards. How exciting is that? Oh, thank you. Yes. It is exciting. Yes. Y your book has gotten some really fantastic reviews and, and, you know, feedback from the community. We say this to most of our guests, but thank you for being so brave to share your story. Because I get the sense that you're, you know, a relatively private person and this wouldn't be something you would immediately do, like get your life out there in the world. Yes, that was, it was very hard for me in the beginning because I, I felt ashamed and I was embarrassed and I didn't want anybody to know my story and my life. I didn't want it splashed in the paper, but the raising family were just found and determined it was going to be everywhere. It was, it was in the National Enquirer. Oh my gosh. It was horrible for me. I just, I wanted it private. So yes, you know, it took me a long time to come to this point. And it was my son. He said to me, Mom, you need to write a book. You need to tell your story. And, and he said, you can help people with your story. They can see that everything that you have went through, you survived. And they said, I, I said, I can't. I, I will hurt people. And he said, Mom, what if you help that one person? Is that worth it? I thought, yes, it, it is. And then once I started talking and telling my story, 
I could see in a group setting, I could see people I could connect with. They weren't, most of them, were, of course, weren't switched at birth, but they've had trauma in their life. And they can understand, you know, and say, I've had this trauma and, you know, I can seek help and I can do, she did it, I can do it. You mm -hmm. know, a, lo a lot of mine is faith-based. I mean, I, I know that I would not have survived without God in my life. Uh, he just carried me through at the weakest points in my life. And of course, now it's easier to see where he was, you know, looking back. I didn't know that then, but yes, and I have helped people. And it's so nice when someone comes up to me and says, thank you for sharing my story or sharing mm -hmm. your story. It has helped me. You know, it's helped me with my people will later on say it's helped me with my family, with my relationships. We want everyone listening to read the book. So we're not going to give everything away <laughs> in this episode, but I would love to touch on a couple of the things. You mentioned the National Enquirer. So I'll sort of set the scene. Uh, you were at the hospital with your grandson and your husband discovers this National Enquirer, your photo, and he tries to scoop up all the copies, but it's like, I mean, there, it's, it's national. So it's everywhere. Right. What is your gut reaction to that? He brought them in and... I mean, he was just devastated. He said, I am so sorry. I tried to get all that I could get. And I'm like, okay, show me the page. And he did. And I was like, I was so devastated. It was so biased, I guess, maybe the word. They all had very nice pictures of themselves. And they took this, one of my worst pictures when I was probably a sophomore in high school, which I had a difficult time and, and I, my shoulders are very rounded and, and you can just look at my body language and see that I'm sad. Something's wrong, but I mean, it's this horrible picture and I just could not understand how you could sell your story because I found out later on, they sold it for $600. Why would I, I, I don't understand it. It was humiliating already I to me I, you know and I felt like this I was made to feel like this was my fault wow and correct me if I'm wrong but it was the woman you were switched with and one of your raising sisters that sold the story like how did they even team up to do this how did, did they even know each other no this was after the fact after the DNA test after finding the sister finding their raising their sister and I found my biological family that this happened that they were contacted because it was on the Good Morning America show and 48 hours in the Rosie magazine so it was widely known and I was hiding in the background trying to you know not not be seen and not do anything. I just, it was, it was too hard for me. I mean, that's just such a horrible act of betrayal to you. And then fast forward years later, you get asked by a family member, is your book going to hurt us <laughs> after this happened? <laughs> it's, I mean, for those listening, this is we're re, uh, recording the, the episode with Shirley. We had some technical issues last time, so we know more of her story than we typically do <laughs> with guests. But just when I when we spoke to you and just hearing about both your raising family and birth family, just heartbreaking. But as you said, you know, DNA doesn't make family love does. And so thank goodness now I, I, I can just tell that you're certainly in a better place, you know, with your family and your chosen family. So. That's, you know, a good thing. Yes. My granddaughter said to me, but Nana, now you're in the right family. You know, you, your heart just melts because, yeah, I, I am in the right family, but there's always triggers, you know, just certain things that are, I don't think that I will ever totally heal. I'm, I'm not sure if anyone will, would totally heal. I we are always going to have triggers. It's how we choose to deal with them. What was the hardest part about writing the book? I thought that I had healed. 
I was like, oh, yeah, I failed when the professor asked me. And I'm like, yeah, I failed. And the first few chapters I wrote, I just wrote it like an accountant, just like a PowerPoint. You know, this happened, this happened, this happened. Everything was in a nice line. And my editor said, well, how did you feel? And he said, I didn't feel. And she's like, no, you felt. You had to have feelings when these things happened. So I went back and rewrote it with feelings I thought I should have <clears throat> because I still didn't think I had any. Then at that point is when I went into counseling again. And, you know, after probably five times of going in and, and talking to her, and I knew her too as a, as a friend, I had always just said I was switched at birth on this date. And, and that's how I would say it without going into any details. And finally, the dam broke. And I, I, it just broke and I just cried and cried. And I, I thought, how I did feel and it did hurt. So then I had to go back and rewrite everything. And, you know, I'm sure for some people hearing that it's, it's triggering because they feel like they might feel like they've healed, but what they've done is bury it. <clears throat> and you had to like dig it up a couple of times, <laughs> which, but if you hadn't, who knows how it would have manifested itself down the road or where you would be right now. So, I mean, it's great that you did. And I'm not, you know, telling people what to do, but, you know, therapy, community, <laughs> it's all important. Well, and when I was writing my book, I read The Body Keeps Score, which helped me a lot. It, you know, it's how, what trauma does to our bodies. And my health was, I had had so many surgeries and it was just one thing after another. And typically it, it starts with an autoimmune disease. And I had Sjogren's syndrome and rheumatoid arthritis. And then it just manifested into severe pain in my neck and surgery. You know, it just went on and on. And I had a physical therapists say to me, I don't know where you'd be right now had you not started therapy, she said, your body was falling apart. Put it in easy, you know, it was just, it was taking its toll. You two were kind of just talking about things that made me think of how ambivalent I can be about my grandparents on my biological, on both sides, because, you know, I hear stories of my father's parents, you know, who of course were upset, disappointed in my father, you know, for being a boy and getting a girl pregnant. And, you know, um, they weren't willing, interested to, you know, raise a baby, which, you know, I, I don't really understand that, but I try not to judge that decision either. But I also feel the same way about my biological mother's parents because they were the ones who didn't allow her to keep me, you know, and I love my sister, my mother's daughter, and she'll say, I want her to tell me things about our grandparents. But when I hear nice things about them, and I'm using air quotes, listeners, you know, it's hard to relate. It's like, oh, well, it sounds like she's really good to you. And she told mom to give me up. You know what I mean? Like it's, and, and again, it's, I feel like that's probably a childish uh, reaction for me to have, but it's maybe that's okay. Maybe I'm coming at it from a primal sort of level. Like, you know, why wasn't I good enough to keep, you know, and it's, they didn't know me, of course, you know, I was, I was two days old or whatever, but it's just, um, it does hurt you. It, there's something deep-seated that that you can't maybe i'll never let go of that you know that those questions that i have the rejection is heartbreaking and you know like with you though it that's what was that that was what society expected of course i don't know your grandparents or anything like that but back then 
it brought such shame to families. You know, they get rid of the baby, hide the mom, do all of that kind of stuff. And they didn't know what they were doing to that child or to themselves. Because I think that as a mother and a grandmother, I would carry that within me. And it would be hard. I'm not saying that I'm forgiving them, but, but I'm try, trying to look at it at a different point of view that you weren't rejected. You were, it's what society expected. True. That's very true. And my adoptive parents, thankfully, always gave me that idea. You know, they didn't know the circumstances of my birth, but they were very quick to say, well, it could be that your mom and dad were super young, which was ironically true, but they didn't know that. And they would always normalize that and say, you know, some grandparents just aren't equipped to take care of babies. And that's the reason we got you. You know, it was very matter of fact. And it did help me normalize those feelings as a child. It's as you grow up <laughs> that you start feeling the, you know, hey, you know, what, what about? What about the grandparents? What about, you know, it just all the questions start coming when you, as you grow. But then on the other hand, too, I, because I look at the way I was raised, maybe you were better off not being raised by them. I think that's true. <laughs> yeah. Kendall's brother has, has said as much, you yeah. know, and we've heard some of the, you know, like Kendall's parents never laid a finger on him. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> it would not have been the case. Yeah. The other way. So, and, and you go into, you know, great detail in the book, but surely you would have been not in a great place had you not been switched at birth, had you been, you know, gone with your birth family. My therapist said to me, she said, not only did you escape one dysfunctional family, but two, because the one that I was switched with, she died five years after finding out we had been switched. She had a difficult life, you know, and sometimes she didn't make the best choices, but neither one of us had a great life, but it was what we chose to do about it. The choices we made, you know, and, and I had faith and, and I know there's points in time in my life that I, you know, like as, as a young high school girl I was engaged and going to get married and broke up and had a baby you know got pregnant and I had to call him and tell him I was pregnant he said I'm dating someone else now and she's pregnant too and I don't know what to do and I'm 17 years old and I said well I do we're done but that was but that wasn't me talking because I wouldn't have been smart enough at that age and I was in a bad emotional state to have said those words. And to me, that was God talking for me because it was the best thing. It was like, yes, we are done. We, we feel like we're constantly on a roller coaster, you know, with this, <laughs> with the family, you know, twists and, and drama and trauma. But one of the things that I remember best about our first conversation was the way you spoke about your Aunt Mary. Can you talk a little bit about her? Yes, she is just, she was the first person I met and she had a pharmacy in a grocery store and, you know, the pharmacy is typically in the back and I had no idea what she looked like. And I walked into the pharmacy and I'm like kind of walking up and down the aisles and stuff. And then I look up and I see this little Mexican woman walking so fast up to me and she came up to me and she said, Oh, you look just like your mother. And that was the first time in my life I had been told I look like someone. I was the milkman's daughter, the mailman's daughter, everything, you know, like, oh, her mom had an affair and she's a, so to hear those words, I had waited 43 years. And those words were just, you know, it's just fabulous. And we just had this 
instantaneous connection of love. And she taught you how to make Mexican food too, right? <laughs> yes, she, yes, she did. She, I had never canned food in my life. And she taught, we would like the cousins, we would get together and rent like a, an industrial kitchen or a commercial kitchen. And we would just can all this Mexican base that we use in our food. We canned like 12 cases of quart jars of this Mexican base one year. <laughs> all of us girls did. She taught me how to make tortillas and how to, she doesn't, didn't ever measure anything. So I would sit at her house and she would like when she made tortillas, she would grab some flour and I would measure it. And then, you know, everything she took, I would measure it and I would write it down. So I have all these recipe cards of things that my Aunt Mary taught me how to do, uh, taught me how to make. I would not know anyone in my family, my biological family, without my Aunt Mary. She took me to meet people and cousins and I have a cousin Nick and his wife Brenda and I'm really close to them and my cousin Brenda's like a fabulous cook too and I'm always like Nick and I are sitting there and Brenda's whipping these tortillas out and I, I'd say to Nick I wish I could make round my goal is to make perfectly round tortillas and he said you know how you do that and I said how and he goes Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> and I'm like, thanks, Nick. <laughs> I know this book has, has changed your life in so many ways. And what is next for you? I, I mean, you're, I, you know, listen to you speak at Summit and you're a great speaker. I mean, is that something that you would like to do? Is there another book in there? Or? Because my health has been, I've had quite a, few surgeries and I had surgeries writing my book right now I am concentrating on healing my body before I go forward and do anything else I know I just one day I was supposed to uh do a um something for like a class or you know just speak and I that's when I found out one of my mother's was her health was not very good and I mean I I just broke down and I was just crying and it was so hard for me because I thought I can't even do this and you know and I was crying and my daughter talked to me and she said I just said I feel like such a loser I can't even do this and I, I feel horrible and I'm bawling all the time and she's like mom it's okay you have done so much. All you have to do is call and say, I cannot do this. I'm not capable right now. So that was in like July. So I really haven't done anything. Thank you for saying that because I'm going to make my mom listen to this episode because she's been dealing with some health stuff over the last couple of years too. And, you know, she gets it that she's not, you know, 50 anymore. <laughs> You know, like, I, I think she has a difficult time telling people no, you know, mm -hmm. when it comes to like, you know, can you, can you do this? And just like, when I hear some of the stuff that she's like physically doing, I'm like, ma, <laughs> don't do it. But uh, so thank you for saying that. I'll make sure she listens to this episode. Typically, I'm not much of a crier, but I was just sobbing. And when my daughter said that to me, I was like, you know, and she's like, you're the best, you know, you you have done so much and she just oh it was so wonderful to, to have her embrace me and do that and my husband's like kind of in the office and he doesn't know what's going on and and then they had got our hot got everything ready at the hot tub and got me chocolates and ice water and got everything ready so i could go sit in the hot tub and relax I thought, oh, that was so sweet. We'll be sending out the positive vibes for fast healing for you physically. Because okay. I have a feeling this is not going to be the last time we've heard something from Shirley. I certainly hope not. <laughs> but in the meantime, do you have a preference on where people purchase the book? Amazon, wherever is fine. Yeah. 
even ask for it in their local bookstores too. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah, that's so nice. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. Well, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, Shirley. We love you. Hopefully we get to see you at Summit uh, in 2026 and uh, keep healing. Yes. Shirley's story reminds us that family isn't always about DNA. It's about love, resilience, and sometimes finding your tribe after the most unimaginable twists. Her courage to share her story, to turn her pain into purpose, is exactly why we started Family Twist. But this is just one of the many incredible journeys we've been privileged to share. If you thought this episode was stranger than fiction, just wait until you hear some of our other episodes. From stories of secret siblings found through DNA tests, to families reuniting after decades of separation, we've got more twists, turns, and emotional journeys ahead. And if you're listening to this thinking, hey, my family has a twist that needs to be told, let us know. We'd love to hear your story. In the meantime, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and follow us on social for updates on our next jaw-dropping episodes. And remember, family secrets are the ultimate plot twist. The Family Twist Podcast is presented by Savoir Faire Marketing Communications and produced by How the Cow Ate the Cabbage, LLC.